Okay, boss. Hey. Hey, what's on for today? <laughs> um, well, I'm doing clinical forensic medicine today. Oh. Yeah, so um, they are the people who deal with the living. They gather the evidence to help with crimes. Um, a lot of um, sexual crimes that they deal with. So, you know, I can't say I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. But I'm interested. So let's go back to the beginning and say so what it is you actually do. Do you want to just... You okay, know? well, look, I'm in charge of the clinical unit, which yeah. is the unit to do with live people. A lot of people think of forensic medicine as just being pathology work with the deceased, but in fact, there are lots of occasions where live people come in conflict with the law or come in contact with mm. the law. And then it involves almost any aspect of human behaviour, really. So, um, you know, particular things I'm talking about today might be people that the police want to interview. So you know, they might want to interview somebody for some serious crime and they want to make sure that what the people say um, is, is done in, in an informed fashion so people aren't affected by drugs or intoxicated with alcohol or they're not suffering from mental illness or they don't have painful injuries that are distracting them or there's some other issue that might affect the way that they can represent themselves in an interview. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So we often go and see them for the police after they've been arrested and um, we don't uh, give an opinion about how truthful they're going to be. That's, that's the job of the courts. <laughs> um, but, you know, the, the phrase that's used is, can a person calculate their own advantage? So they've got to be able to understand the situation they're in, uh -huh. uh, what the implications are, um, the reason why the police have got them there, you know, what could happen to them, those sorts of things. So we spend a lot of time with people about to be interviewed. But how do you deal with, with mental, uh, you know, Well, fitness? if people are really mentally unwell, obviously they're not fit to be interviewed. Yes, um, but, but how do you judge that? Well, you know, you ask them questions, you sit right. and talk to them, you interview them. We've got a, um, a form of, of questioning that we use that's got certain little simple tests for, for um, uh, how well people are switched on, if you like. There's right. a, there's a little thing called the mini mental state examination where you ask a people a set of questions, simple questions about you know where you are, can you do some simple arithmetic, simple memory, can you read and write, those things. And at the end of it, you get a score, mm -hmm. which can be quite useful. So in things like policy you were talking about before, is mm. if you, like, like 0.05 say, you know, yeah. is that something that's come out of your area? You 0.05 know, that came out of one of my predecessors, yeah, Dr. Right. Birrell back in the 1950s and 60s had a lot to do with um, you know, the first laws in the world really here in Victoria about 0.05 and driving and, you know, the use of the breathalyzer as yeah. it was in those days. Um, I've had a bit to do with some laws to do with drug effects on driving. So there's a, a special procedure that was brought in in 2000 where the, if the police pick up somebody who is, is not intoxicated with alcohol but they think there's some other form of, of impairment, they you know, do a little test on them and they get a blood test taken by one of our nurses uh -huh. And then we have to put it all together and see whether or not the impairment um, could be attributed to whatever drugs they might find in that mm -hmm. person. I was on the child abuse service here in Victoria for quite a few years and that was, that was actually quite unpleasant. Yeah. Not yeah. so much, well, you know, the child abuse part's bad enough, but it's the social things that you get exposed to that are really unpleasant yeah. in, in the child abuse world. How did you cope with that sort of... Well, you've got to have good personal supports yeah. at home and, you know, you've always got to come back and say, you know, as the old saying goes, the patient is the one with the disease. Yes. You know, um, even though you see it, it's your job to try and improve things for the people that you see and it doesn't necessarily extend to you. Maybe we should start with, like, what is a day for you, like, what is the beginning of a day for you? If you come to work, what, what happens? Um, well, that. Well, um, our day. Well, I suppose our day can vary. I can be en route and then dispatched to a job, yeah. or um, be in house all day. So it would just depend. Um, the day of the week is yeah. so different. Every and day most, is different. And most of our work is after hours. Really. So why is that? I mean, that's when that's when these things happen, and that's when, or both when they happen and when they're reported as well. Yes, um, right. So people, 
you know, something might happen to someone and they might go to work or do other things and have time to reflect on it and um, not actually report until later on. And um, so a lot of our cases, happen, the majority happen after hours. Yeah, so as, yeah. Soon, as, it, so as soon as something's reported, you, you, you become involved, yeah? you, you, you're called in or? So when, some, when somebody reports to the police, mm -hmm. um, the police might call us uh, to ask for advice about where to take things next. Mm -hmm. If the person presents to a healthcare provider like a hospital or to their GP, then the GP can either call the police to take the next step or they might call us for advice. Mm -hmm. And do they take that from, from the victim, you know, for the person who's, who's reported it, will they say, what, what do you want to do next? Or is it, is it as far as calling you and, and, and your help or is it um, something that, that is decided because it's a criminal case? So the entire process is entirely uh, individual focused, so uh -huh. the focus is on that person and what they want to do and their choices and giving them agency, um, reclaiming, you know, reclaiming choice about what's happening to them. Yeah. So it's up to them to decide what they want to do, but we give information in order to um, give, you know, for, for them to be able to make up their own mind. Yes, yeah. And so take me through what would happen, you know, if, if well, if, if someone went in and reported it to police, so we can't actually be involved with patients until the police are. Uh -huh. So that's um, just legislation here in Victoria. So once the police are involved, um, they will then determine, we'll have a chat to us and we have time frames around doing forensic exams. So we can see people up to seven days usually after a sexual assault. That's quite a long time. That's, it is, we can yeah. actually yield some, um, some evidence yeah. up to seven days. Every case is individual, of course, and um, depending on what's actually happened, mm. we then will give advice to police about the best course of um, an examination process. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We also do photography as well, so if someone's been injured, um, we can take photographs. Again, that can be days after an incident as well, and then provide a report to police and give an opinion on that. Mm -hmm. And so then are you involved in the case after that? You, you know, you, um, do you go to the courts if, if it goes to court? and? Yeah. yeah. So when we see somebody, we would um, look after them for that for that encounter, make mm -hmm. sure that their medical needs are addressed, um, and, in, and do examinations to you know to assist the police in their investigation. Then afterwards, we would produce a medical report as a as a product of our clinical encounter, and then that report um, the police would then use that as part of their investigation. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately, if the case does proceed to um, to the courts, then we, we we might be asked to give evidence. Yeah. Have you have you noticed a big change in your work? Just as I mean, you know, what's happening at the moment is just it's so much more discussed and so much more sort of um, out in the open. I suppose. Have you found that in your work? I know you've been here for ten years. That 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 it's helped in 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 what you do, or has it changed? That, people's um, opinion or uh, processes? I think with all the publicity probably increasing in the last 12 months, especially in the entertainment industry, yeah. of these well-known figures coming forward, I think girls are a little bit more empowered to come out, yeah. feel a little bit more confident. And I think part of our process is, is giving them back the power. They control the examination. So if you know, I had a patient who didn't want to be examined intimately, who just said they wanted some photography, that's fine. Yeah. So yeah. I go on how we're going. We work together um, to produce what we can. And if someone says, look, I've changed my mind five minutes, that's absolutely fine as well. We again make sure that they're medically okay and um, give them some medications if they need it and yeah. refer them on. Do you, has, has the incidence of reporting increased, do you think, or um, over the last 10 years, say? Or? I think so. I think it had, the numbers are increasing. Yeah. Um, who's, who's to say if sexual assault's increasing? Because it's such an unreported crime mm -hmm. um, in Victoria and probably throughout Australia and then probably at, throughout the world, actually. What do you think is needed then to change that? The, the, the sense of unreporting. What what is it that stops people reporting? I think there's a lot of people have a lot of um, um, fears about, or people might have a lot of fears about what happens after a person reports, both both with the acute phase and what happens with an examination, but also the court process mm. because it is demanding, or it can be demanding, um, and I think 
people might have a sense of um, you know uncertainty about what what that might involve um, a lot of people are assault, assaulted by people that they know um, and there can be implica implications for reporting on on those relationships mm. um, and um, you know there might be effects on um, on if, if a person's been assaulted by an intimate partner, what effect that might have on the stability of their home environment and their partner's earning capacity and all those kinds of things. So there are lots and lots of um, reasons why people might be hesitant about reporting. Yeah. How big is your team that you work with? We have, um, so in-house here at the Institute, I think we have nine forensic medical officers and myself and I coordinate the nursing service in regional Victoria where I have 19 forensic nurse examiners that work for us. Is that enough, do you think? Is it big Never enough? enough. <laughs> Never enough. So no. you, can you imagine that how, like in a, in a perfect world, what would you need for this, for this to, to, to be dealt with in the proper way, you know, in, a, in, in the, the best way possible? What more do you need? In an ideal world, mm. um, every woman or man who reports um, a violent offence, be that a sexual offence or a physical um, violent offence, would be able to have a timely um, response um, in a location that is, you know, that is quite accessible to them, um, and in an environment that is is welcoming and safe. Um, so that you know that goes to the location of examinations and the the you know the number of service providers. Um, um, but I think we do very you well. You do offer quite a lot. Of we do, we do we yeah. do. I think we we I think we offer a very good service. Yes, we're getting yeah. there definitely yeah. with our new multidisciplinary centres that we have. We're about to open another one in Wyndham near oh. Werribee, which is a one-stop shop for police and social services and and us and forensics. Yeah. So. Yeah. And as far as you working in this field, what is it that you find the most positive aspect of, of, of what you're doing here? I think you can really build a very good relationship with someone and help them um, at a very crucial time of their life during a crisis period. And that's an enormous privilege um, to be able to um, having meaningful encounter um, and assist um, a wider justice process as well um, at a really critical time. One of the areas that we're also increasing our focus on is in family violence. Um, so if a person has been uh, assaulted by someone who they're in a relationship with or who's a family member, um, then they can um, present to police. Um, and if they've sustained injuries, then we can um, document those injuries, address any medical needs, make referrals, mm -hmm. um, provide a sick note for family violence leave, um, and really help um, bolster and um, make a, a robust, um, help provide robust evidence for that, you know, that complaint going forward with the police yeah. to yeah. really you know, try and ensure appropriate justice outcome. Okay, tough oh, one. How'd oh, you go? They were really amazing people. Yeah. I just, every time I was uh, sitting there, I just think, aren't we lucky? Isn't Victoria lucky to have this sort of service and to have people like, like, like them? They, they were so sensitive and so caring and so keen for them to show that they're there to help. Yeah, it was really moving. Mm. Yeah. Put on them. Yeah.